Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's lecture, State Pier on the Thames, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. This lecture is part of the past and present vision of the Thames lecture series sponsored by Thames River Heritage Park Foundation. I'm Catherine Foley, Executive Director of the Foundation. Before we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge that we are on the original lands of the Pequot tribal nations that include both the Mohegans and the Mashantucket Pequots, the first stewards of the land. Tonight, as we learn about State Pier on the Massapequatuck, AKA the Thames, may we be mindful of this land's heritage and honor and appreciate the legacy of the native peoples, the Pequots, in whose land we now gratefully live, work, and play. Thames River Heritage Park is privileged to share the story of the rich heritage of the Pequots and those that follow. The foundation was established to connect, promote, sustain, and support Thames River Heritage Park, a collection of heritage sites linked by water along the Thames. In collaboration with more than 20 sites and heritage institutions that comprise the park, the foundation carries out its mission through educational and historic boat tours, walking tours, self-guided tours, our popular hop-on, hop-off water taxi and harbor cruises, which connect passengers to the park sites on both sides of the river, and programs like this one. Like all of the foundation's programs and initiatives, this series is made possible thanks to the generous financial support of our members, our sponsors, our donors, and people like you who donate gifts of time and treasure to support the sites and their stories for us in the present and for generations to come. Before I introduce our esteemed presenter, I would like to review a few etiquette guidelines for tonight's presentation. We ask if you are on Zoom that you please mute and stay, keep your video off. This way we minimize the distractions to the presenter tonight. We also want you to know that in between the presenter and the, and the, and the screen, the view of the screen, there is a little slider that you can slide back and forth to make the presenter larger or the screen larger. This evening, for those who are on Zoom, we ask that you refrain from using chat and you use that for question and answers only. That way we will be able to follow the questions more easily. As those of you who attended our first lecture in this series by state historian Walt Woodward, you will remember that John Winthrop envisioned a thriving new London in the new city he founded on the deep water pot port of the Massapequatuck, which he later called the Thames. This evening, we will hear from Brian Rogers about the rather checkered history of the building of State Pier, and we will explore how history, its history throughout its development. We are also privileged to have two special guests this evening from Connecticut Port Authority, who will discuss and give their insight on the future of State Pier. Ulysses Hammond, Interim Executive Director, and David Corris, board chair. And now what we've all been waiting for, State Pier on the Thames, yesterday and tomorrow, today and tomorrow. Brian Rogers. Thank you, Catherine. And this is the title of, a, of an exhibit that I prepared for the Library of the Custom House Museum. My colleague, Laurie Derrida, Dita and I have been running the library now for about 11 years. And we don't get a lot of traffic, partly because we're not a circulating library, uh, but we do get questions. And most of our questions for research purposes come from emails. We even had a question from Russia, which as I think about it now is, is really kind of amazing. The question came from a, a, poly, a, linguistic, a, poly, a, a linguistic historian of Polynesian languages. And the question had to do with a New London sea captain who'd been at Easter Island in the Pacific, and there was a there was an incident of some kind, and he wondered if I could shed any light on it. 
I, I shed a bit of light, but I didn't know it. Imagine getting a question from Russia. Most of the questions come from Southeastern Connecticut, but we have questions from across the country as well. But as I say, uh, as a library, that we're, we're volunteers and the library is not open a lot. We can't be there a lot, but we, even though we have a great collection of books and papers. So we decided recently to start creating a set of online exhibits, digital exhibits on topics of, new, of interest in, in New London maritime history, anything at all, but drawing from our collections to use the collections to have some way to present what we have. So we've been doing that. And among the 16 exhibits now on our list is this one called Bringing the Ships to New London, A Tale of Two Piers. Now I'm going to page through this um, and I hope I don't do too much jumping around I'm going to skip some of the early material you already know about the harbor in the Wars of Independence, the War of 1812, but maybe you don't know about the Central Vermont Railway and how important that was to the development of things. So let me get up to that here. Pardon my clumsiness. I've already done it wrong. Here we go. I have to get used to this. Works just the opposite of mine. When rails met the sea, the Central Vermont Railway Pier was the forerunner of the Connecticut State Pier. And any account of the history of, of these piers really must begin with the railroad age. Now in 1830, the first railroad in America was the Baltimore and Ohio. Very primitive operation. The cars looked more like stagecoaches than on wheels, but it was a railroad and it was the beginning of the railroad mania which spread across the country like lightning. And in New London, the first railroad was the New London, Willimantic, and Palmer. And you can tell what the route was for that, straight north in 1849. It started near Winthrop Cove and it ran up the side of the river as it does today with a different name. And then the company, it turned out, was not at all profitable and it had to be relaunched in 1861, actually, as the New London Northern. They improved the bridges and the tracks, new locomotives, and this is a map of New London uh, in 1909. This is a little bit. So we've been looking at the map, and we're going to go beyond the map. But what the, in the center of this map is a great big black line at an angle. That is the Central Vermont Railway Pier. And to its right, still missing is the great big state pier, the Connecticut State Pier, which is roughly the same size. This is what we were working toward. This beauty, this wonderful locomotive of the New London Northern is parked at the New London Roundhouse with its crew and the rest of the crew in front of this spectacular brickwork of the Roundhouse. I think that's just an amazing amazing shot. And that's one of the locomotives that went north from New London to Palmer, maybe and beyond. Then we got on, as I said earlier, I guess I don't think I did say that Central Vermont did have a steamboat pier from the very beginning. And they enlarged it in, 19, in 1876. And here it is in 1912. Ships docked on both sides, a steamboat on the left, a schooner on the right, tracks full of boxcars, and I don't know if you can see, but I'm moving the cursor. That's the, that's the Groton New London Ferry. It's, it's, it's going down. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's what I was doing. Okay. But that's not it. This is it. Early movers and shakers promote New London's harbor. New London, of course, was famous for whaling, one of the busiest whaling ports on the East Coast, maybe third in terms of tonnage and all. 
but everyone knew that wouldn't last. And so people started thinking, well, what, what can we do to replace that? What can be the engine drive, the driver for the economy? And as early as 1862, John Rogers Bowles, we have a share a common ancestor in James Rogers, who was brought here by John Winthrop to operate the old town mill. But I digress. Um, John Rogers Bowles and Alfred Coit said, tried to persuade everyone that a Navy, this would be a good place for a Navy yard. And the legislature took it up and the government approved and the Navy yard was established eventually. Uh, in 1877, the same John Rogers Bowles, who was chairman of the Board of Trade, which today would be called the Chamber of Commerce, he published a pamphlet called New London, a seaport for the North and West, describing the advantages of a smaller, well-situated port within, with the amenities cited 15 years earlier for the Navy Yard, such things as a commodious and deep harbor, security afforded by Fort Trumbull, salubrious climate, absence of ice, availability of coal and iron, and a population of hardy seamen and skilled naval mechanics. And here's the cover of this little pamphlet, New London, a seaport for the North and West. It's great commercial advantages, which included a supply of pure water and other such things. This was published, printed in New London in 1877 by the power press of George Starr maybe the Star Street thing. The way one navigates through these exhibits at the bottom of each section, and there are about 12 sections, is the place over here where you click and you go to the next page. And I'm learning how to do this a little bit. The dream realized, the state of Connecticut funds a new pier. And this was largely the effort, well, it was the effort of many people, but the mayor and the and state senator, Brian Mahan, in 1911, in what Greg Stone called the ongoing quest for New London's elusive economic progress, they persuaded the legislature to appropriate a million dollars for a thousand foot ocean terminal to be built just south of the rail bridge, railroad bridge in East New London. The state owned terminal would drive the city's bid to attract ocean going freighters whose owners might find it more advantageous to dock in New London instead of Boston or New York. And the city hired Waldo E. Clark, a young engineer interested in our future. He oversaw construction, even design and construction and operation of the pier. These are surveyors standing on the central Vermont pier, looking toward the, west, toward the east and the area where they're beginning to, to do something about the new pier. These are probably the vessels and the equipment of the T.A. Scott Company, which built the pier. And behind the surveyors and behind in the center is the bluff of East New London. And I'm gonna have a lot to say about East New London presently. But before the construction could begin in the water, we saw a little bit of it there. The land at the waterfront site had to be drastically changed and they removed much of the substantial bluff and flattening the rest. And John Ruddy, John Ruddy described it in an article in 2019. He said, two years of construction changed the East New London shore as tons of earth and mud were scooped up here and there and deposited, scooped up here and deposited there to create new land. A dozen homes were raised or floated down river and the train tracks were rerouted. Here is the section on East New London. Uh, East New London, a neighborhood in the path of progress. And I talk about how New London expanded north, south, and west, but also there was this little area called Win Winthrop Neck, John Winthrop again, which developed into a very compact little residential neighborhood beyond the central Vermont tracks and beyond the steamboat pier. And it was a wonderful place. It had long views of the harbor and the bluff was called the bank. And it was the site of several large houses and many more behind them. And this was East New London, whose misfortune it was to lie in the way of the city's maritime progress. Here is a hazy picture. I'm sorry, it's not better. This is also taken from the central Vermont pier, but there's the bluff 
stretching across and then it curves away to the north slightly it curves away and there's just a little piece of the railroad bridge visible on the far right and I'm, I'm sorry that's not a clearer picture there were several very large homes there it says now i can't remember i think i showed you this before in a different context about the central vermont railway pier which was which formed the western boundary of east new london so we'll skate on by this and I want to show you a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the houses that had to be removed. Uh, here's a beautiful Greek revival house. It shows up in many of these pictures. I'm sorry that this one doesn't show the fan light in the gable because it had that too. Um, and I say one house in particular catches the eye, this classic Greek revival house. Here's the view looking down the harbor from the backyard of that same house. And in the center behind the tree is one of the central Vermont freight boats. The central Vermont, I should explain, the central Vermont pier served only coastal steamers, coastal steamboats. They were not ocean going boats. That's the huge difference between, or one of the huge differences between the central Vermont pier and the state pier. The state pier clearly was for ocean freighters, but the central Vermont pier nevertheless was a very busy place. But I should tell you that these exhibits are all available on the internet. They're very easy to find <laughs> if you despair of ever seeing it. Although that's a, that's a good picture. I'll tell you what that is. That's the backyard of the house we've just been looking at. But these are all available on the web and you can look at them your heart's content in the privacy of your home on your desktop, your laptop, and you can read and you can skip what you don't want to see. And so I do hope you will do that uh not only for this but for all of our other exhibits these are the backyards and there's the rail the new railroad bridge of carrying the main line of the shoreline the later that become the new haven railroad uh across the the top of new london of, of east new london these next are pictures thank you again pictures of the excavation going on much of the village of much of the neighborhood has been torn down. John Reddy spoke about the steam shovels excavating, dumping the earth here and there. Here is a wonderful picture. There is the Greek Revival house, but in front of it is a house that's up on, it's on rollers now is going to be moved away. And over on the right is the Harbor Master's house. Hezekiah Bartlett was the Harbor Master. And you're going to see his house in a moment. Here's another view. This is from the central Vermont pier loaded with railroad cars. And there's the Greek revival house in the middle and the Hezekiah Bartlett house is no longer there because it has been floated down the river. And this is what was done with several of the houses. They took the porch off and what I wish I knew is whether that house is standing somewhere in New London or not. It may very well be, it's a pretty big house. And then I composed a section called An Elegy for East New London. John Ruddy provided me with a wonderful article that came out of the day in 1914, it was published in the day in 1914, when it was known that the state pier was going to be built. They are nostalgic glimpses of, of a life that uh, was soon to be a memory. This was a place, this is the text of it, I won't read the whole thing, but it says, East New London Bank, soon to be a memory, the place where Neckers gathered to exchange views would give way to approaches of the ocean terminal. The bank must go to make way for the approaches to the new steamship terminal. All of that section of East New London from the central Vermont tracks to the shore and from 12th Street South will be dug out and leveled for the, at the grade of the tracks for the freight terminal. Again, I mentioned the, the importance of the railroad. The state pier as well as the central Vermont pier were built to connect the railroad to shipping through the piers. The railroad, without the railroads, this wouldn't have been going on at all. And of course now today, today the railroad is no part of any of it. We hope maybe it'll come back, but we don't know yet. He wrote further, the bank commands a fine view of the harbor. The twinkle of the light on race rock may be seen from it. The terminal of the boat race course may be viewed from either bench, apparently benches, all of the shipping operations of the harbor are observable, observable at this point. For as many years as anyone can remember, there had been two long benches on the bank where the Neckers gathered. 
The benches probably had more to do with preserving the serenity of the neighborhood than any other feature. Okay, now we're on to construction. We're getting there, people. But what was going on at the same time, or shortly, was war breaking out in, in Europe. Second, the First World War, the guns of August. But construction was, this is a wonderful photograph. It gives you an idea of the nature of the bank, as it was called. This is it's really quite high here. You see this person is sort of perched on the edge and the, fall, the land falls away. And here are small people down at the shoreline, probably more TA spot equipment. Uh, things are getting underway. That's 1914. Here is a picture of construction is really moving ahead. The Greek Revival House is still there. We're almost through this. Here's the pier. The two sides, the stone masonry sides are in place. The tracks run out onto them and the TA Scott equipment is there. And in the next picture, farther along, it's much of it is filled in. 1915. So it was in the next year that it was finished. They're filling in the center doing the opposite of what's being done with the two piers now. But no, that's not the opposite. The same thing, I should say, the same thing. We're filling in the space between two sides of one pier. Now we're filling in the space between both piers. We get on now to the story of the Deutschland, the German submarine, commercial submarine that was the first tenant of the state pier. Oddly enough, it was one of the bizarre things in the history of this pier. Uh, the, a German shipping company wanted to make the state pier, the American terminal for its cargo submarines. So they would avoid the, the embargo around, around uh, Germany and also avoid the Royal Navy on the surface, carrying high value. They didn't say they were obviously that they were carrying war material, but that, what they really wanted to do, and that was pointed out by people who studied this history, they were interested in carrying things like copper and nickel and rubber, things that Germany was short of. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how New London welcomed the Deutschland, and I think the business community in particular welcomed them, because it meant that maybe the state peer had a first live tenant and things could move forward. Even though the Lusitania had been sunk uh, with the loss of nearly 1,200 lives, but much of America was isolationist and didn't wasn't interested in getting involved in a Europe European war. That of course changed. Here is a picture of the Deutschland tied up at the new pier. The Germans <coughs> built temporary sheds. The shed that we're so familiar with in pictures hadn't been built yet. They built temporary sheds. Here's the submarine, and there's this mothership, the SS Villehad. And there's a fence they built across on the water side so that nobody could look in from boats, as well as fences on the land side that would prevent you from looking in. It was a very secretive operation. Here's another view of the basin, and there are some of the big houses still on top of the bluff. They stayed there for quite a while. This is another view, actually a better view. There's the Villa Hut, the submarine, the fence. And the last picture shows the innocently, the innocuously named Eastern Forwarding Company, which had been set up by the Germans to run this program. The Eastern Forwarding Company. Doesn't sound like a German company, but it was. And New Londoners found this spot where they could peek through and have a look at something. It looks like there's a gate open or something. I don't quite, can't quite tell, but these are all New Londoners coming to try to see what's going on behind all the fences of this very secret operation. One other picture of the Villa Hod. These pictures came from a Norwegian, from a website called Norway Heritage. And so I'm, because many Norwegian immigrants came over on that ship at, on an, at another time. So, we know the story of the Deutschland. I don't want to go into it too much more, but John Ruddy said in his article of 2019, this undersea exploit disguised as civilian commerce was a military operation and its only purpose was to procure supplies for the German war machine, which was a bad thing to begin with. But the tragic end of the story for New Londoners was that when the Deutschland was departing New London, 
on the night of November 17th, it's what, uh, 19 and 16. Continuing her policy of secrecy, she rammed the TA Scott piloting tug. The captain and the crew lost their lives. The submarine went back to New London for repairs and after returning to Germany was converted to an armed U-boat responsible for sinking 42 Allied ships. We move to a new chapter here. Some of our exhibits are illustrated with old postcards. They can be quite charming and very interesting. And I've, we have an old postcard of the State Pier uh, in, I think, 1917. It's after the warehouse has been built. The central building is the, um, the American-built warehouse, not the temporary <coughs> German ones. So this has to be about the time, of, about 1917, and perhaps about the time that the pier was taken over by the Navy. And I show some pictures of the, of the, of the pier during the, this era. Here are the US Navy sub chasers at the pier in 1920, quite a fleet of them. I wouldn't know a sub chaser, but that's what I read in the source of this picture. So I have to assume that's what it is. The Coast Guard also occupied the pier. And here's a view of Coast Guard cutters. They probably weren't called cutters then, but Coast Guard vessels tied up at this pier. Here's a random picture of Coast Guardsmen having pulled something out of the sound and brought it in on one of their little cutters. It seems to be a piece of an airplane. I have it only because you see the state pier in the background. But we move right on. Here is Waldo Clark. Waldo Clark was the pers one person most responsible for operation of the state pier. He was smart and persuasive and became a trustee of the day, whose editor, Theodore Bodenwein, was another outspoken supporter of the pier as an engine of New London's economy. That's what everyone's looking for, an engine for New London's economy. After the war, he was working hard to attract business. And one of the, one of the businesses he attracted was West Coast Lumber Ship, was shipment of West Coast Lumber. And here is a lumber, lumber unloaded. And I uh, think how labor intensive that had to have been. Lumber was only one of the things that, that came. There was a wonderful book that published in 1922 called New London, Connecticut, Utopia on the North Atlantic, the ideal city, winter and summer. And there's, it's, it's a Chamber of Commerce publication and it's, it talks about the city in great detail. And then in the centerfold is a wonderful aerial view I'm going to, I want to keep my text there, but let me show you the, what the view looks like, a little bit more of it. It's a very detailed and it keeps going. It described, the booklet described all the kinds of cargo that was coming, coming in at the pier and leaving it. So I think I won't try to read that. We'll just keep going. I do have to tell you about this bizarre proposal from a businessman who wanted to operate a new ship line, passenger ocean liner line between New London and Europe, either Liverpool or Southampton perhaps. And they would carry an airplane on this ship. And a day before the ship was due to arrive at either end, people would get on the airplane and fly there and save a day. They would fly to the airport near the port which sounds like an absurd idea. In fact, it was an absurd idea, but many people thought this would be a great thing for New London. And, and Senator Hiram Bingham even went to Washington and tried to get Congress to do something about it, but that was obviously not ever going to happen. I want to move on to the New London plan of 1928, which is known as the Swan Plan. It was the city's first experience with urban planning. He was concerned, they were concerned, New London was concerned with automobile traffic. The streets were not designed for automobiles and they were really taking over. So Herbert Swan was to going to advise about the street layouts and lanes and so on. He also addressed the natural asset that John Winthrop was attracted to, the harbor. He wanted the city to buy the land along 
water, Pequot Avenue, all the waterfront land along Pequot Avenue to preserve it for the public, to preserve the view for the public. Of course, it didn't happen. He also thought there was room, for, he said there is room for another pier next to the state pier, but there doesn't seem to be a reason for it yet, but it could be easily provided with the same railway facilities, but they shouldn't do that right away. There's an elegant map with the Swan Report. I'm gonna scroll slowly through it. I think if you can look at this at home, you'll really like to see these maps. They're beautifully drawn. And the one I want to show you about is the bottom half, which continues here. Swan's most revolutionary <clears throat> suggestion was to fill in Green's Harbor, fill in Green's Harbor and build piers into the Thames available for the largest ocean vessels. The close proximity of the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad at that point, away from the congestion and tight clearances of downtown made this an inviting location for a terminus for large ocean craft, if you can imagine it. Just below where we're sitting at this moment, there's Fort Trumbull, Wallback Street. Here's where Pfizer is and here's Greens Harbor. That would be filled in. And here's the railroad right over here on the left which would be a better connection really than the central Vermont because the central Vermont went north to Canada. The New, the New Haven in those days carried freight and it would go either toward Boston or New York or everywhere else that the, that in fact that the uh, New Haven went. However, all of this evaporated with the stock market crash in 1929. Something entirely different and I won't dwell on it, but old Ironsides came to New London and was docked at the state pier. They, Park, they tied her up at the end of the state pier with her bow facing Groton Bank. And she was there for several days and many, many people came to see her. She'd been rebuilt with a major fundraising of, of public funding, not public funding, private funding of donors. American, the, the American public was invited to donate for the restoration. Congress was unwilling to fund the whole thing, but they did rebuild her essentially, and she came to New London. Now, the odd thing is that there was never a picture taken of her in the day. There probably are pictures of her, and would we ever give our eye teeth to have one of those? But there are no pictures of her tied up at the end of the state pier. And then there was a lot about the some quotes from the newspaper about the visitors. And on the last day, 6,530 persons went aboard. Many children from the seaside sanatorium were brought over in a bus. And then the ship left, and that was that was the end of that. There she is going down the river. She had a, a Navy vessel was really piloting her, it was lashed to her. And that was her source of power. She went up and down both coasts and also the Gulf Coast in 1931. Shipping came back after the depression, but then along came World War II, changed the whole thing. And the state pier has always been uh, commandeered by the military, by the Navy in particular. Uh, but as Greg Stone said, World War II transformed New London and its surroundings from a stagnant victim of the Great Depression into a busy hub of military activity. Lots of submarines were being built. Um, I, and the submarine base was just upriver. I, well, I'll move right on beyond that because I can't focus on that. Anyway, Walter, after the war, Waldo Clark tried to drum up business some more. He felt, oh, I know, this is an important, this is an interesting point. As Gregory Stone reported in his book, Waldo Clark had a call from people in Brooklyn running a little company called Charles Pfizer and Company. They wanted to come to Groton and see if there was any space available for them to expand. And EB had an, had an unused yard at the south end. And so the delegation came, they bought the land and the rest is history. Didn't have much to affect to do with the state pier, but I, it's a fascinating thing that Waldo Clark got involved in. He was also very, thought it was very important that we should do more regional cooperation. And I have this wonderful slide, uh, postcard 
he wanted Waterford, Groton, and New London to band together and, and have some kind of a port authority, port authority. But he that never really happened. He thought it would be a great idea, and he thought that that would be a way to try to boost the activity at the piers. Um, this is a rather hideous postcard in terms of color. And the odd thing about it is that the railroad bridge is completely airbrushed out. This is this dates from probably the late 40s. And why they had the need to airbrush the railroad bridge out, I don't know, but there they are. There was a lot of criticism. Walter Clark had a, had a lot of criticism. People said there was a white elephant. The pier was a white elephant. People resented the tax exempt status. They wanted compensation from the coffers of the state. Here are a couple of aerial views. I will just go by them to see, you can see what it looks like from above. Uh, the two piers are almost identical in size. A lot of the land in the center is central Vermont trackage, which illustrates how important that was when all this began and how it really gradually disappeared. This is a more distant aerial view. These are fun to look at up close at home, and I urge you to do that. This is, of course, before urban renewal, and there's only one Gold Star Bridge at that point. Marketing New London Terminal. This, this was someone, um, someone running the terminal came up with these posters for what they were calling New London Terminal. They didn't call it the state pier, they called it the New London Terminal. Um, these are photographic negatives, so it's white on black, but there, there's the complex in the center. There's the 203 area code number. So this must be back in the 60s or something, 70s maybe. Here are all the attributes of the terminal and 1,000 foot pier, open storage for six acres, adjacent to 95, rail connection to Canada, so on and so forth. Fork trucks, straddle carriers, truck cranes, pier lighting, bonded warehouse. And then this rather attractive map, serving the Northeast with water, truck, and rail. And there is New London Terminal going in all directions. This is a section called Here in Jeopardy. I'm very proud of this picture. I took this picture from the walkway of the Gold Star Bridge in 1953, when there was only one Gold Star Bridge and the walkway was on the ocean side, with the Long Island Sound side. I walked across and I snapped this picture, which at the time I had no idea I'd be using in the year 2022. It's a Kodachrome, but the poster colors it all gone bad. I, this was in 53. That's, and the reason that's here is that that's the year that Waldo Clark died. So he lost, the pier lost its most energetic advocate. The shipping continued, but it somehow wasn't the same. So what happened in the set, the, the, you know, here's a, my, I don't want to skip over the, the, the Cold War was developing. And the Fulton arrived in 1951, and it's visible in my photo, and I think we'll see it again. The photo, the, the Fulton arrived in 51 and was here for 40 years. Half of the pier was consumed by the service of the uh, servicing of the Fulton, even though she wasn't tied up at the pier, she was tied to the dolphins that had just been removed within recent months, so-called dolphins that were out in the river. She tied up to them. Um, but shipping at the state pier never seemed to reach a critical mass that could be described as busy or successful. And one city official said the piers were in a state of limbo. It is woefully underdeveloped considering its potential. And this had been going on for a long time and it kept going on. However, along came containerization. And we have a book in the library about that called The Box. This bold idea had generated a lot of discussion and cap a, a captain, a sea captain from NOAC, Joel Sears, and a group of businessmen tried to persuade the powers in New London, I don't know quite who they were trying to persuade, that maybe New London could be made into a container port. 
containerized shipping was upending all the time honored methods of, of shipping, as we know, we all know about that now and what the problems are with that. Um, reduced shipping costs. There were so many advantages apparently to shipping. Although, as I say here, it turned out to be a double-edged sword. Consumers enjoyed the luxury of unprecedented abundance of affordable, well-made goods from cars to t-shirts. But the steady decline in domestic manufacturing was devastating to those whose livelihood depended on it. And we're paying for that now and to a very large extent. Here's a picture from the day that's showing the outline of the new container port. Here's the Fulton, the two piers, and so on and so forth. I have a few pictures of container ports in Canada. This one's actually in a town that's smaller than New London, but this is Prince Rupert. But I'm going to skate by these. You know what containers look like. Savannah is a big container port in this country, as we know. And here's the railroad connection, which is so vital, a train leaving the port of Savannah. But the container port idea never gained traction, and we'll always wonder what might have happened if it had. Then another idea was surfaced and came to light in 74, and that was making a $5 million expansion plan, $5 million expansion plan proposed for the state pier. So this new plan, Yes, a six month study of the state pier by a New York engineering firm was called the last best chance to convert the piers dwindling operations into an economic energizer for Southeastern Connecticut and all the advantages that it was going to have. They were going to, the, the proposal was to have it become a major port of entry for raw agricultural products from Southeast Asia, but that never happened. Here's a view of the Fulton tied up at the pier. In this case, she's not at the dolphin, so this must predate the dolphin, but you get a good view of sense of the pier structure too. Then the Berlin Wall fell, the Fulton and her squadron left, and many people thought, okay, the lackluster economic performance of the pier meant we should move on and do something different with it. But Morgan McGinley in the day and Admiral Harold Shear, retired from the Navy, thought otherwise. And so they entered the fray and they were very uh, powerful voices against fix bringing the pier up, bringing the pier back and whatever, whatever needed to make it work better. I have a piece here about the historic American engineering record, and I'm not going to go through it except to show you this one picture. The historic American engineering record is, a, is, is just that. It's a documentary photographic collection of notable American engineering projects, such as our pier, but it can be dams and bridges and ships and anything that engineering creates. And this, these records are kept that are notable examples of them. These records are kept at the Library of Congress. So the record, the, the H-A-E-R for the state pier is at the Library of Congress, along with a lot of documentation and pictures. And there's a series of photos. I'll just go through them. They're as though archival photos. They're not intended as photographic art, but simply to show how it looked and there was a very large ship in the day they came. I'm sure that was by intention. The day the photographer came, took all these pictures. And here's some of the text that goes with it. The state pier is part of a 30 acre complex owned by the state of Connecticut. And it describes it. I'm not gonna read the description and says who built it. The tracks approaching it. We've seen this picture before. There's the track running down the length of it. Many interior shots. This is a paragraph I do want to sit and read. The Connecticut State Pier is significant as a typical example of early 20th century pier engineering and is one of the earliest attempts by the state government to encourage economic development by means of a major public improvement. It was built with the hope that substantial shipping would result from the pier's access to the Central Vermont Railroad. 
which connected with major lines in the Midwest and Canada. While only a modest success economically, the pier provided an important port facility to the US Navy in both world wars, which was, well, it was a mixed blessing. I want to get past these wonderful interior shots. Here's Admiral Scheer coming aboard, picture of Admiral Scheer. He was very persuasive and he, he was so such an advocate for the pier that it was eventually named for him. But we're going to move beyond that. You wonder what a Navy person would know about shipping. Well, as a matter of fact, he became the director of the Maritime Administration, the US Maritime Administration from for four or five years. And that exposed, him. he must have already known a lot about commercial shipping, but he learned a great deal more and was very well qualified. When the long warehouse and iconic water tower were demolished in 1995, the state pier seemed to recede from public consciousness. The remaining flat surface lying just a few feet above the water suggested absence rather than presence. It's a very interesting company and this is its CEO, believe it or not, Madeleine Pacan. Then I have a section about the cruise ships, which I thought was an interesting diversion from all the lamenting about the fact of the economic the, the, the poor economic performance of the pier. Here's the explorer of the seas coming in, approaching Greens Harbor, which is still a harbor, not a pier for giant ships. And so I talk a little bit about that. I found some good pictures. This is one of the Royal Caribbean ships leaving just outside where we are now, leaving the fort, going by the Eagle, which is tied up at Fort Trumbull. The Moz Dam came. The broad open deck of the State Pier was a perfect location for tour buses to meet the disembarking passengers. And the last ship was the Crown Princess on an 11 day trip. And well, that was in 2010. And finally, the cruise ship task force had to disband. Then there was another study about the State Pier. And this one was in tremendous detail. and it, went through all the reasons, all the problems that needed to be repaired and all the goals that could be met. And the, the report was issued in 2015 and nothing happened because there wasn't a lot of interest at that point in the state was in the financial straits. I'm not sure why I have this picture here at this point, although it's one of the few pictures that shows a ship on either side and neither of them are the floating. So, Here's how it looks today, but not too much to see. <laughs> Although I must say when I drove in tonight, when Carol and I came in, there were four, if not maybe six cranes, you have big yellow cranes filling the sky that's very empty in this picture. This is more about the report. And I talk about the report and the justification for fixing up the pier and making it work for its original purposes. And then in 2019, out of the blue, or maybe not out of the blue, came the idea to create a staging area for wind farm development offshore. And so that's where we are. And I'm going to stop there. I have, I have a whole section about, the 20, well, it's called 21st Shipping. Term, 21st shipping terminal or wind turbine staging area or both? Because that's one question. This is the Block Island wind farm, which is not too far away. People, um, and you know about what this text is about. We've been reading it in the paper now for the last two or three years, two years. But there's some good pictures of the Block Island wind farm and here's how it looks up close. And at this point, I'm going to end because uh, there's more to it. You can see it all on, on my exhibit online. I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the technological glitches. And I hope that some of it at least has been interesting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much there, Brian. That was fascinating. <laughs> and um, um, I, 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 I can say that uh, when you talk about the future of the pier, um, there was a quote here about the future of the pier being the engine of New London, economic development in New London. Well, 
I think tonight we're here to once again be able to say that the pier will again return as the engine uh, for economic development of, of New London. I wanna, I wanna also thank uh, Paul Weisskabel for the invitation for us to be able to come here tonight uh, and to uh, give you an update as well on uh, the, the pier, but also on the Connecticut uh, uh, Port Authority as well. I'm joined here um, by uh, the chair of the Connecticut Port Authority and the person who has really um, almost single touch, wouldn't say single handedly, but he's played a, a really um, important part of getting the uh, project uh, to the point where it is today, where we can actually see the end, quite frankly. We have a date and we'll talk about that. Uh, we have a date in terms of, of finishing uh, this project. Um, and we also have an idea of exactly how much it's going to cost. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. I'll, I will just kick things off. I'm gonna turn it really over to our chair, uh, David Corris, uh, to talk about the, uh, the, the status of the project. I just want to open it up by indicating to you that the Connecticut State, uh, the Connecticut Port Authority uh, has the authority now by the legislature uh, to, um, to improve uh, the uh, economic development and infrastructure of th th the three deep water ports that we have in Connecticut. That is in New Haven, Bridgeport, and New London. But we're also responsible for the economic development and improvement and infrastructure improvements of 36 uh, harbors as well. And a lot of people do not know about the fact that we are also uh, responsible for those harbors. I have already visited on Norwich Harbor, which is uh, the first one I visited upon my arrival. Um, and it was a week and a half later, because I've only been on the board now, on, on board now for about three and a half weeks. Um, but the, about a week later, I was uh, in Branford as well. So we are, are supporting uh, the development of these harbors and the infrastructure of these harbors. Um, and I, I, it gives me an opportunity also to mention that uh, we have what is called um, a, a state uh, harbor improvement program, and it's called SHIP. It's uh, the state harbor improvement program, and we have the, some state funding for uh, these harbors, and the grants are uh, due by July 1 of this year. And so the word has been out to, to all of our, um, our mayors and selectmen of, uh, and select persons of our region. As a matter of fact, uh, today, uh, the Connecticut uh, uh, Southeastern Council, the Southeastern Council of Governors um, visited uh, the, the tour, uh, and had a tour of the, of the harbor, I mean, of the pier today. We started this morning, which is why I'm a little tired right now. We started real early this morning uh, with a presentation at the mayor's office uh, with the council, uh, but we followed it up with a full uh, tour of the, of the uh, pier today. I want to also invite all of you to also uh, just come on over like Brian did and just take a look at what's, what's happening. It's really fascinating uh, what's taking place at the State Pier today. The future of the State Pier, as I indicated, is bright. Uh, it's very promising. Um, but before I also turn it over to the chair, uh, there's also one, one other responsibility of the, of the uh, uh, Port Authority that I did not mention even this morning. I forgot to mention this morning that uh, we were also responsible uh, for the pilot commission. There's a pilot commission uh, that um, uh, comes under the, the Connecticut Port Authority. And so the Pilot Commission is responsible for the licensure, licensing, if you will, the licensing, the licenses of all of our pilots uh, that uh, required, that's required basically many uh, for, for coming in, for, that is for going out, bringing uh, ships into so many of our, our uh, deep, water, deep water ports. So I'm gonna turn this over really now to our chair who's going to bring uh, the, the message to you about uh, where, we, where we stand today, okay? 
Great. Thank you so much, Ulysses. And we're so happy to have you on board and just the short time that you've been here. Um, I can already tell what a great uh, asset you're going to be to the organization and a great connection to the community. Um, I'll be brief so that we can leave some time for Q&A, but I'll try and just sort of add the last chapter or the most uh, recent chapter to um, the story that Brian just described. And I think it is really interesting to think about uh, the current iteration of state peer within that context, because when I look at that history of CV peer, of state peer, of naval involvement, the different uh, economic development concepts, I mean, it, it has really been a checkered history of frankly, failed attempts of utilizing public infrastructure dollars to spur economic activity without a really clear sense of exactly what was going to happen next. And I think clearly the wars had a huge impact on that. Um, I think also the fragmentation of ownership and control, having CV Pier under separate ownership from State Pier, having the neighborhood of East New London there, it was a very difficult site to manage. And we're at a unique moment in time where the entire facility is under single ownership, the Connecticut Port Authority that has a, a very clear mission empowered by the state legislature to guide maritime economic development through the investment and management in our coastal infrastructure. And that's exactly what, what we are doing. And I think the, the most recent study that Brian referenced from 2015 um, is a very interesting one because it pointed out, as, as Brian said, in great detail, all of the deficiencies at the facility. It is not surprising that a facility developed 100 years ago plus modified modestly uh, decades and decades ago had, uh, you know, a disconnect between the current needs of, of maritime sector and the physical uh, conditions. And so that report pointed out a whole variety of things that should be done. Most notably, it basically said you need to do three things in order to make the facility more versatile and more valuable. You need deeper water, you need more upland storage, more flat land contiguous to the, to the pier, and you need heavier lift capability. The facility could accommodate about a thousand feet per, excuse me, a thousand pounds per square foot. And that was just not adequate for the types of cargo that we might want to run through it. But the report said, don't do these improvements exclusively on the public dollar. Wait until you have a private partner who's going to pay for some of those improvements and who you're sure is going to use it. And so when the Logistec contract with the state expired and we went out to RFP to find a new operator, we were incredibly lucky to have a partnership come before us, Gateway Terminals, Connecticut based, and Ersted and Eversource, the developers of Offshore Wind, who said, we are going to bring capital to the table to invest in your facility, we are going to use it for at least the ne next 10 years at the foundation of this new industry. And Gateway as an operator demonstrated through their other facilities, the creativity and the entrepreneurship to figure out what comes next. And so that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we designed the facility, infrastructure is expensive, waterfront infrastructure is very expensive. There were uncertainties. Uh, costs escalated once the numbers became real through escalation of costs of merchandise and materials and cost of labor. Uh, but we have a solid project cost. It is fully funded, about two thirds by the state, one third by our private partners. And when it's finished in March 1st of 2023, less than a year from today, Ersted and Eversource are going to take it over with Gateway, begin developing their first wind farm uh, called South Fork, which will be a feeder barge system. And then amazingly, when the first American-made, American flag offshore wind installation vessel is finished, it is currently being built, $600 million dollars. 450 feet long, 200 feet wide, the first vessel of its kind that is allowed to go between US ports. 
when it's finished in Texas, owned by Dominion, the first lessee of that boat are Orsted and Eversource, and its first port of call will be New London. And so just in the way that people flock to the port to see the German sub, just in the way they flock to see the American battleship, just in the way they flock to see the cruise ships, they will flock from all over the country to see this installation vessel and these windmills that will be as tall as the Gold Star Bridge developed in New London. And what is so interesting about this cargo Right at, at the at the end of the day, it's just a cargo that's moving through the facility. But unlike all the other cargoes that have been talked about in the past, containers, fruit, agriculture, lumber, those all just move through. The wind turbine materials come here and then at State Pier in New London, welders, electricians, they put them together. So there'll be over a hundred jobs at the pier working on these goods. So it acts as both a logistical facility and as an open air manufacturing facility. And that'll happen for at least the next 10 years. We hope for the next 17, maybe beyond. We don't know what comes after that, but we do know that at that time when wind sunsets, the facility is far better positioned to take advantage of whatever the next opportunity is that we probably can't even think of today. Um, so we're very happy to be part of this once in a generation investment. Um, you can see it out there. It's, a, it's just over 50% finished. It will be finished March 1st, 2023. And you'll start seeing turbines uh, a year from now. And uh, hopefully you're all as excited about it as we are. Happy to answer any questions. And Brian, you, you too. Folks may have questions about other other historical stuff too. Yeah. When these turbines are going to be built here, you start more manufacturing and that stuff. How much of that is going to be imported goods will then be incorporated into the wind farm? And will the wind farm be within or without the the US waters? Yeah, so all the wind farm lease areas are within United States waters, but not in any state's waters. Um, we expect that initially the primary turbine components, which are basically, there's four pieces, the foundation, the tower, the nacelle, which is the turbine itself and the blades. Initially, most of that will be manufactured in Europe because they have built 30 gigawatts of power and they have the entire manufacturing pipeline to do so. Those big pieces come over here and then the littler pieces get added on and the big pieces get put together. And our hope, and this is one of the things that, that Paul is working very diligently on with sector and the state is working on through the Department of Economic and Community Development, we hope that over time, more and more and more of those pieces are built on the East Coast and a disproportionately high share of those are built in Connecticut. And we have land constraints, right? We're not gonna get big, hun multi hundred thousand square foot manufacturing facilities. So we need to be realistic about what can and can't work in Connecticut, but the workforce that we have and the peer that we have position us well to get as much of those components as, as makes sense. Yeah, yeah, please. My reason for asking is that New London County, anywhere in New London County can be made a foreign trade zone. Yes. And that benefits people who are importing goods and labor distributing them or bringing pieces in to get it and sending them offshore. This is not offshore. That's, that's yep, that is one of the components of the sort of governance and regulatory milieu that makes this attractive. You know, New London is blessed with a natural harbor, a lack of horizontal or vertical constraints and proximity to a cluster of lease areas that positions us well. But without the port facility, that location is, is meaningless. Um, and, and now we will be the, the first place uh, to have the infrastructure to advance this industry. We won't be the only place, um, but the expectation is that 20 to 30 gigawatts of power are built off the East 
East Coast, comparable to what's been built in Europe. And there's not, there's not a dozen of these facilities in Europe. There's not one, there's a few. And we will be one of those few. There'll probably be one in Virginia. There'll probably be one or two someplace else, um, but we'll be the one for this part of the seaboard. And that's pretty darn good. Yeah. Uh, looking for the future, let's say when, when, when it's done, would this would there be a pure hydro capacity for cargo or a container cargo? Is there enough land area to install that? Yeah, so theoretically, um, I think that there's a couple challenges. One is um, despite the rail upgrades um, up and down the coast or up, up and down the corridor, and I do want to um, sort of correct one thing rail does still exist on the site. It's a different configuration, but rail still exists on the site. The, the potential for inter, intermodal shifts from boat to rail and vice versa still exists on the site and will in the future. Um, but there is a bridge constraint from the Northeast Corridor, so we can't do double stacked like you saw in the um, Southern example there. So that is a constraint, but also, you know, container ports are near big population centers. Um, we, we, we don't have a lot of land. We don't have the big population. I'd say it's probably unlikely, but I think what's, what's more interesting is, you know, these big manufacturing components that again, we can't even think of today that dovetail with other things going on in Connecticut, whether it's aerospace, or subs or any number of the other industries we have, that's a real niche opportunity. Um, and it's that high value stuff that, you know, I think, I think creates a lot of potential. Let me just ask another question. Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> so at, at what point will there be any availability for vessels other than winter, wind turbine connected? Yep. Will we be able during this 10 year period to bring in ships from the rest of the world? Yep. The short answer is potentially. Um, there may be down periods between wind campaigns and during those down periods, Gateway will be responsible for dovetailing other cargo. But I, I would argue, what's the difference and why, right? Our, our objective is to move as much stuff through the pier as possible and create as much economic impact. And if that is being done by wind, then maximum utilization of the facility is our objective, no matter what that is. If it's 100% wind, great. If it's something else, great too. I, I hate to jump on you, but... Yeah, yeah go ahead. If we have shipping coming here, that stuff hits the ground, it has to go away, which means you need trucks, you need trains, and that's an industry that's local. At one point, we almost had Don Car Limited, which is the Canadian equivalent to Forest Products, that General Motors in the 1950s was to cars. They couldn't come here because our city council then, then would not allow, would not file for a foreign trade zone. Dom Tar was had actually made a verbal commitment to our bank mm -hmm. to come here. But the, it would have a tail of uh, at least two or three companies creating truck yards out here, bringing more employment and, and so on. So when you say to me that I'm asking, is there going to be state for the ability to come in? It will add to the, to the local economy. Yeah, but I, I would argue that the hundred plus electricians, no, no, welders no, 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 is advantageous. I'm not that. Yeah. What I'm saying is if that space is available, yeah. then we should have a gateway work to fill it because it will bring more. I mean, you know, we're going to have 100 or 200 or 300 wood, but, you know, electric boat has what, 15,000? Yeah, uh, it's not more though if it's displacing wind activity, which has more jobs per acre. No, no, no. Not displacing. Well, but it, but there's only a certain amount of acreage, and that that's, that's what's. What I was asking. Yeah, yeah. So as long as you're building wind turbines, there will not be other cargo coming in. 
as long as there is a wind turbine farm under construction, which doesn't mean, which doesn't mean every day of those 10 years, because there may be gaps between campaigns. So they may do a farm and then have a three month gap that could allow for other cargo. But yeah, but the hope frankly is every day for the next 10 years that they're building wind turbines because that is good for the local economy. And regional. You know, just put it in context, you're looking at 30 gigawatts of power, you're looking at 2,500 windmills. You know, so yeah. I think the, the install vessel can do three or four uh, windmills at a time. I put it down in context, the earth has 5,800 windmills. It took a decade to do it. I think you all misunderstand my question. My question is that what is based on, I've heard that there would be no use at all available. And then you know, the first indicated there might be. Yeah. So I was just following that. Yeah. I'm just looking to the future yeah. that what will happen there. That's all. Yeah. Not that this will be all. Oh, I'm not saying it's all going to keep stuff out. I'm looking to get some stuff in at yeah. the same time. Yeah. This is Exactly. Exactly. That that's the way that I think about it. Regardless of cargo type, we want to maximize the facility all the time. That is likely going to be entirely wind for a lot of the time. But anytime it's not entirely wind, absolutely, then we backfill with other stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. 